Welcome to this video on the physics of the recorder. Today we will be discussing how duct flutes like the recorder work in relation to what we've been learning in class and with reference to further research. In terms of NCEA level 3 physics, a recorder is an open pipe. So we know there's going to be an antinode at each end and at least one node in between. The wave reflects back off of one end of the pipe and becomes out of phase with itself interfering to become a standing wave. Now usually in class and exams we draw standing waves like this, like a wave in water. However, air actually works in longitudinal waves, with compression and rarefaction. Think of it like a spring made of air. For the purposes of this video, I will be drawing the standing waves like this, the light colour being the node and the dark colour being the antinode. So, how do we actually start the air moving to create the standing wave? Because if you just blow through a pipe, like a straw, or even the wrong end of the recorder, you generally won't get any sound. So how is the recorder different? Well, if we take a recorder and split it lengthwise down the middle, this is what the mouthpiece would look like. When you blow air into this end of the recorder, the air travels down this narrow passage until it reaches this sharp edge here called the labium. Now when the ear reaches this point, it oscillates between moving above and below this edge. This creates a standing wave in the main pipe of the recorder, due to the wave reflecting back out of phase and interfering constructively and destructively with itself. Now I know how to make a sound with the recorder. Woo! But why does the recorder sound the way it does? Here's a recorder playing a note. Here is a pure tone at the same frequency. If we compare these two graphs, we can see that the recorder wave is not the same as the pure tone. If we analyse the component frequencies of the two, we can see that the pure tone gives one main peak, while the recorder has multiple peak frequencies occurring at the same time. These multiple frequencies are called harmonics. For example, this is the first harmonic under the tone's frequency. This is the second harmonic, this is the third harmonic, and so on. These harmonics occur at the same time and so interfere constructively and destructively to give the recorder its timbre. These multiple frequencies are caused by harmonics. Just like we learned in class, these are multiples of the fundamental frequency, with a higher number of nodes and antinodes, resulting in higher frequencies and lower wavelengths. Now we know some of the basics of the acoustics of the recorder. But we still can't play many songs with just one note. So how do we change the pitch of the sound we are producing? Well, there are a number of ways to do this, but the easiest way is to change the length of the pipe. We know from class that velocity equals frequency times wavelength. Velocity is equal to the speed of sound through air, which is mostly constant, but we'll get back to that later. So we can rearrange this equation to show that frequency is proportional to 1 over wavelength. And so if we decrease the length of the pipe, we will increase the frequency, and therefore the pitch, that is produced. Now before you go cutting up your instruments, the length of the pipe I'm referring to is the length of the vibrating column of air, which is making the noise. We can make this column shorter by creating a large opening in the pipe, which will act as an open end, meaning the wave will reflect and form an antinode at this point, rather than the end of the pipe. This will decrease the wavelength and so increase the frequency produced by the standing wave. We can cover this hole with our finger to make the wavelength longer again. We can calculate the theoretical length of the ear column we need to produce specific notes. Musical notes occur at specific frequencies which we can use with our equations to work out where a hole should be made on the pipe of the recorder. An additional equation I didn't mention before is that wavelength is equal to 2 times the length. We know this because at the fundamental frequency of an open pipe, there are two antinodes and one node, and so there can only be half a wavelength in the pipe. On the screen we have an example of how to work out the length for the note A, but we can use it for other notes as well, for example D and G, and so on. You may have noticed that the holes on the recorder are of differing sizes. 
If all the holes on the recorder were a uniform size and distance, it would be difficult to play. By changing the sizes of the holes, we are able to move them to a position closer to where our fingers would naturally rest. If the hole is made smaller, then it can be moved closer to the mouthpiece. This is because the smaller the hole is, the less effective it is as acting as an open end. Because the holes aren't perfect open ends, the wave actually extends past the hole, and the smaller the hole is, the further it will go. This allows for fork fingerings, where the remnants of a wave can be extended to create a slightly deeper tone, called a semitone. Ask any recorder player what happens when you overblow, and they'll tell you that you get a squeak. This is because the frequency of the note we hear is determined by the strongest harmonic, which is usually F0, the fundamental frequency. A common phenomenon that occurs when learning the recorder is overblowing. This is usually unintentional and occurs when someone blows too hard on the mouthpiece of the recorder. During overblowing, the fundamental frequency and every other odd-numbered harmonic is suppressed, so the second harmonic is heard instead. The second harmonic has a frequency of two times the fundamental, and so a much higher note is heard than what the player might have intended. Without the odd harmonics, the timbre of the recorder has changed dramatically. If we compare these two graphs, we can see that the timbre of the overblown note is much smoother than the timbre of the normally played note. The amplitude is also much higher, so you'll get a very loud sound. This is a graph showing a note being played on the recorder normally, in blue, and the same note being overblown in yellow. As you can see, the fundamental frequency of the yellow is much less distinct, and the second harmonic is more prominent than when it's being played normally. Another way to increase the octave of a note, more controlled than overblowing, is to leak one or more of the holes. This is primarily done with the thumb hole, and by making the hole smaller, but not completely closing it off, you can force the ear column to split into two. This means that there are now two ear columns, one from the labium to the leaked hole, and one from the leaked hole to the next open hole. The effect of this is very similar to that of overblowing, with some harmonics being suppressed. This will result in the frequency that we hear being twice the fundamental. However, in this case, the amplitude is not increased, so the sound isn't as squeaky. By suppressing harmonics, the timbre of the recorder has changed. This is why, to some people, the recorder sounds better at the lower octaves. It has a more distinct timbre. I hope I have explained how the recorder produces its full range of notes, from the deepest sound with all the holes covered to the higher octaves that can be reached by leaking one or more holes. Following this are some extra points that I found when researching for this video. I can't find much information about how the shape of the ball affects the sound. I do know, however, that in most modern recorders it tends to be a curve tapering down towards the end that helps change position of the nodes and antinodes, like the size of the holes do. Because the standing wave is made out of vibrating air, when the holes are closed, the length of the column will be longer than the length of the tube, as the air inside the pipe will push at the air outside the pipe. Therefore, when making an instrument, an end correction must be taken into account. There is no definitive formula for end correction, but most sources tend to agree that it is around 0.3 to 0.6 times the diameter of the end of the pipe. I said before that the speed of sound through air is mostly constant, and you may be wondering why. Well, the speed of sound through air actually changes depending on the temperature. This is why you often hear of warming up before performances. It helps get the sound moving faster, which will increase the pitch of the instrument. So why does this happen? It's simple. Cold air is more dense than hot air. This means that it will have more resistance than hot air. So if you haven't warmed up, your instrument will start out flat. And that concludes this video on the physics of the recorder.